This is a video covering the lecture for section 1.3, Evaluating Limits Analytically. Now before we were doing it numerically, which was basically just plugging in the number or plugging in a bunch of numbers, um, creating a table to find the limit. And then we were doing it graphically where we were just looking at the image of a graph and deciding what the limit was. But in this section, we will have um, to do some algebra to figure out the problem analytically. So theorem 2.1 is the basic limits. It says let B and C be real numbers and let N be a positive integer. So it says if you want to take the limit as X approaches some C value of a constant, um, it, the limit is just going to be that constant. Um, think, remember that constants are just horizontal lines, so it wouldn't matter what x value you were approaching, the y value would always be the y value of that horizontal line, which is this b value, therefore the limit is just that b value. Now the limit as x approaches c of x, when you plug in c here for x, you just end up with c. Taking the limit of x to any power, where the power is a positive integer, Again, as x approaches c, if you plug in c there for x, you just end up with c to the power n. Now theorem 2.2 is properties of limits. So this allows us to expand theorem 2.1 a little bit further. So it says let, let b and c, the letter b, and c be real numbers and let n be a positive integer and let f and g be functions with the limits f having a function at c equal to l and g having a limit at c equal to k. The scalar multiple says that if you're taking the limit as x goes to c of a scalar times your function f, you will just end up with that scalar times the limit for f, which was l. Number two, the sum or the difference. So if you take the limit of f of x plus or minus g of x, depending on whether you're adding the functions together or subtracting the functions from one another, um, that will give you the, fun the function f's limit plus or minus the function g's limit. So if I'm adding these two, then I'll add their two limits together. If I'm subtracting um, the g function, then I'll subtract its limit k. The product, number three, says that if I'm going to take the limit of f times g, then I'm going to end up with the limit for f times the limit for g. The quotient says if I'm going to divide the functions f and g, then I'm going to take the limit of f, which was l, over the limit of g, which was k, provided, of course, that k does not equal zero. Otherwise, this fraction would be undefined, and therefore the quotient rule would not apply. Number five is the power. So if the function is raised to the power, then I just get my limit for f raised to that same power. Theorem 2.3 is the limits of polynomial and rational functions. So it basically takes this, these two together to make polynomials, right? You have coefficients and then you're adding and subtracting terms. So these two rules will create polynomials and then with polynomials on top of polynomials, that means you have quotient rule here. So basically rules one, two, and four will create rational functions. So it says for, if P is a polynomial function and C is a real number, then the limit of that polynomial is just P of C. So you plug in C for all the X's and that'll be your limit. The same thing for the rational function. You have a polynomial in the numerator, a polynomial in the denominator, um, and c is a real number, when you take the limit of that rational expression, you're just going to plug c into that rational expression, which is the same as plugging c into the numerator and c into the denominator. Again, provided that your denominator does not equal zero, otherwise this rule would not apply. So theorem 2.4 is the limit of a function involving a radical. So the let n be a positive integer, the limit below is valid for all c when n is odd and is valid for c greater than zero when n is even. 
So if you're taking the limit as x goes to c and you're taking some radical of x, again, you're just plugging in c for x and you'll get the radical um, a c. The only reason why they have these stipulations here is because um, it wouldn't matter whether this is a negative or not. Um, it wouldn't matter if the number inside was a negative or not, if this radicand is, or I'm sorry, if the index is odd, because you can take the odd root of a negative number. However, when the index is even, this number on the inside has to be positive, because you can't take an even root of negative numbers. That would make imaginary numbers. So it's the only reason why the stipulation is here. Um, that C would have to be positive if the radical was an even radical, okay? Theorem 2.5, the limit of a composition function. If F and G are functions such that the limit of G equals L and the limit of F equals F of L, so notice here I'm approaching C, but here I'm approaching L, okay? If I plug in C there, I'll get G of C, but they're saying that that's just L. Okay, and then here, if I plug in that L value, which is also the same as G of C, I should get F of L, which is also F of G of C, if you think about it, which is a composition function, okay? So another way of writing that is as the limit of X goes to C of F of G of X. So you basically take the limit on the inside first, get that value, and then you take the function value of that limit okay we'll see some examples of this um, in the example portion of this section theorem 2.6 the limits of transcendental functions so again for all the trigonomic functions you're just plugging in C so you just end up with the trig function of that C value these other transcendental functions are a little bit different, like your exponential functions. If you plug in c for x, you end up with whatever that base is raised to the c power. If you're taking the natural log of something, then you plug in that x, you're just taking the natural um, log of that c value. Again, here, when you're talking about exponentials, the exponent needs to be positive for this particular case. I'm sorry, the base needs to be positive for exponentials, and the argument needs to be positive when you're talking about logarithms. Um, theorem 2.7 is the functions that agree at all but one point. So here you let c be a real number and let f of x equal g of x for all x not equal to c in an open integral containing c. This upside down a is another way to write for all. So if you see that again in the future, it just means for all. Um, if the limit of g of x as x approaches c exists, then the limit of f of x also exists since they're equal everywhere except for at c. And the limit of f would equal the limit of g. So recall this section, this problem here from 2.2 examples 1, which I think it's actually 1.2 examples one. Um, we had this problem here and if you recall we went ahead and we reduced it by factoring the denominator and we got the limit as x approaches oops not infinity 8 of 1 over x plus 1. Well, the graph of this function and the graph of this function are exactly the same graph. The only difference is, is here there's a hole at 8 because the denominator would be 8. I mean, it would be 0 if I plugged in 8. And here there is no hole when x is equal to 8. And I'll demonstrate that with the graphing calculator. So if I go to my y equals and I plug in um, x plus 8 divided by x squared minus 7x minus 8 um, graph. We'll see what this graph looks like. And notice that because these two can 
cancel. Actually, even though they do cancel, this is going to create an asymptote here because of the denominator, the x minus 8 being in the denominator. So that's why here there's an asymptote there, which is why I couldn't just plug in 8 in this expression. But after you reduced it, you got to this. Okay, now let's go look what the, let's go see what the graph looks like there. So we have one, oh, I'm sorry, I graphed the wrong thing. That's why, I was wondering why this looked a little odd. Okay, let's do it now. Now it should be proper. Here we go. So there is no asymptote there. Let me get rid of that. And if I zoom in where x is equal to 8, let's see, zoom to, and I want to go over there to where x is equal to 8. Oops. Uh, that's pretty close. So if I trace my graph, notice how I have my x values here, and it doesn't look like it's going to let me go, oh, it might, here we go, there I am going really, really close. Now, it's not letting me see it, but there is a hole there. See how it jumps right over? And if you notice, you can't tell real well, but if I get real close to the camera, you can see that there's kind of one little tiny pixel in there that's missing in between. Not only does it look like it's broken, the line, but there is a pixel that's missing right in the middle. That's the whole of this particular function, okay? Now, if I go in to um, the calculator again, and I just type in 1 over x plus 1, notice that now, I know it's really, really hard to tell, but now there's no pixel missing in there. It's filled in with a little dot. Okay, so now when I trace my calculator and I get to 8, there is a y value for it. So x equal to 8, and I do get a y value. Um, so these graphs are equivalent all except for at that one point when x equals to 8. And that's all that that previous theorem is saying is it's just justifying our algebraic manipulation here in saying that this limit actually equals this limit. Now there's two more theorems that we need to discuss and we will have some examples pertaining to these later. Okay, theorem 2.8 is the squeeze theorem. So it says if you have three functions, h being the smaller one, f being the one in the middle, and g being the larger one for all x in an open interval. So for every single x in a certain interval, this is a true statement. The function f will be between these two functions. This one on the bottom, this one on the top, because this one's smaller and that one's larger. Then if the limit of h equals l and the limit of g equals l as x approaches the same c value, then when f approaches the same c value, it will have the exact same limit, okay? Because remember, these two guys are on one is below and one is above. So if they both have the same y value and f is in between, then it's going to be forced to have that same y value. Now, using that theorem, we came up with uh, theorem 2.9, which is three special limits. So the limit of sine of x over x is equal to 1. The limit as x goes to 0 of 1 minus cosine x over x equals 0. And the limit as x goes to 0 of 1 plus x raised to the power 1 over x, 
that's equal to the natural number E. So here's the strategy. In the next section, all they're going to do is just ask us to find all the limits analytically. And we have to use these theorems that we learned in this section to do that. So the first strategy is to try direct substitution or special limit theorem. Okay. Step two is to simplify or reduce algebraically limitate the function, then try direct substitution or special limit theorem. And if neither one of those two work, then by default you use a table, which is the numerical approach.